people at the margin. I don't know. I don't know whether it's true, but. <laughs> Okay, everyone, we'll start in probably one or two minutes just to let you know I've put it into the chat, but we're now recording this session and it is being streamed to YouTube. Um, I'll be chairing today's session and Parama will be chairing the chat here and on YouTube. So we'll pass through any key themes to me. So please post your questions in the chat in the first instance and then Time permitting, we may call on people to ask their questions orally if they're comfortable doing that. But generally, I will sort of be the person asking the questions. Hi, Tim. Hope life's going well in Aston. Well, I, I, I haven't been to Aston yet. Yeah, no, I know. I heard that yesterday. You were. <laughs> so, I'm employed by them, but. Uh, I, I wouldn't know any difference because yes, I've been sat in the house since uh, since lockdown happened. So uh, yeah, way to be. Maddie, how many are we expecting? Uh, attendees, um, around forty. Oh, lovely. Um, mm -hmm. But they have to make sure that they're using their real names, obviously. I can see. Yes. <laughs> and they're registered. I'm going against the sign up list. Okay. Well, I'm going to start in a minute because we have lots to talk about and lots to show everyone. Um, and we'll leave you to letting them in. Okay, let's get going. Um, welcome everyone to our sixth Econ Teaching Seminar. My name's Dr. Claude Jenkins, and I'm a Principal Teaching Fellow in the Economics Department at UCL and Associate Director for our Centre for Teaching and Learning Economics. I co-organise these seminars with Professor Parama Chowdhury and Steffi from Warwick, who is online as well. In case you've just joined us, the session is being recorded and streamed to YouTube for people who didn't register or who want to watch the recording later. Um, so please keep your mics on mute. Please post your questions in the chat. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty of questions. We've had some interesting ones in advance as well. So what we're talking about today is engaging students through experiments and games. Um, and I'm joined by Bob Gazelle from the University of Toronto and Umberto Lavardo from Pompa Fabra and Barcelona. He likes to spread himself around, I think. Um, both of whom have been using these games and experiments for quite some time, but obviously given the world we're living in, we're going to challenge them to think about how to do it online um, as well. So I'm gonna ask the two of them to introduce themselves give a little bit of background on their teaching experience and to explain a little bit what they mean by teaching with games and experiments. So Umberto, do you want to go first? 
Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to to be here to talk about uh, using experiments in, in teaching. So, uh, as you said, so I'm a professor at the Pompeu Fara University at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. And my role here is because I've been using experiments in the last 10 years to teach uh, introduction to, to microeconomics. And that's my main, uh, my main, experience, my main, my main experience with, with experiments. And uh, for that, I've been using uh, a platform that is called Classics and collaborating with, with uh, Marcus Yamate, Ted Perstrom, and John Miller in adapting a famous uh, well-known book by Perstrom on experiments in microeconomics uh, to this platform that it's the use of uh, experiments online. So what we did is we created a, a, um, what a message. Can you hear me well? Yeah, it's going in and out a little okay. bit. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, so we created a web page that it's a colleague on class experiments where we provide for free all the uh, material that it's necessary in order to run these experiments in, in the classroom. So what we mean by teaching with experiments, it's the idea that the first thing, uh, what we've done is the first thing the students do is to participate in an experiment. So before introducing the concept of anything, they do what we call, uh, what it's called experiential learning. So they experience the idea uh, or the environment in which they are, uh, the, the concept we want to explain happens. And then with the data we get from the experiments, they work on this data, uh, they reflect on the results, we discuss them, and much later it's when the theory class, uh, when we go to the lecture and we uh, extend the concepts, we introduce the more mathematical approach and generalize the, uh, the results we found in the experiments. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell, the approach there. Great, thanks, Umberto. Just, Bob, before we turn to you, Umberto, could you put a link into the platform in the chat for people, please? And um, sure. given that we're having a few sound issues, maybe people who aren't presenting might turn off their campers, see if that helps. Um, Bob, do you want to explain what you do and what you teach and how you use games or experiments in the classroom? Sure. So once again, thanks so much for, for inviting me. I'm really excited uh, to get to talk to you guys about running uh, experiments in the classroom um, and quotes are relevant now. Um, I am by training an experimental economist. And so when I started tr uh, teaching, um, for me, it was natural to introduce games markets experiments into my teaching. Um, when I first started, I was a, an assistant professor at a small liberal arts college. Um, my principles of microeconomics course uh, had all of 40 students in it. And so my, the games markets and experiments that I ran in the classroom were pencil and paper. Um, you know, I would create decision slips, hand them out, run around the classroom like an idiot, collecting decision slips, post the, the results on the Blackboard. It was wonderful. Um, I then moved to the University of Toronto and my, for example, my principles of economics course uh, now had four to 500 students. Clearly running around collecting decision slips was, was no longer uh, um, feasible. Um, so since then, I've used a number or, you know, from the beginning of my career, I've used a number of online um, platforms for games, markets and experiments. Um, you know, one of them is related to courses I would teach in industrial organization, um, where I um, had students use Severn Borenstein's um, competitive strategy game. Um, that one had students making decisions across the, the length of the semester in teams as firms. Um, I've used um, Charlie Holt's um, Beacon Lab, Virginia Economics Lab is uh, 
an online platform for running games marketing experiments. And most recently, I've been using a paid service, um, MobLab, um, which I'll be demonstrating in a little bit um, for running games markets and experiments. Thank you. So Umberto already sort of suggested that one of the advantages of this is students sort of see live something like a Nash equilibrium or a Kernow equilibrium. Um, Bob, what would you say the main value of teaching with games and experiments is? Um, you know, I, I, you know, so a couple of things come to mind. The first is, you know, I think, you know, as Umberto, you know, alluded to, just having students experience the economic environment is in and of itself um, valuable. Um, you know, we often make a lot of assumptions and as economists, we perhaps run through the assumptions perhaps a little too quickly, um, but when students are actually placed in the position of decision makers, right, they truly understand the decision we are imagining them having to make and, and imp importantly, the constraints that, that they are faced. Right. And it's often, you know, really satisfying when a student asks why, right, to turn the question back and say, well, you just participated in this environment. Why did you um, continue to be greedy and, you know, not contribute to the public good, right? Why did you, con you know, choose to affect in a prisoner's dilemma? Um, the second big thing is, you know, at least for some, uh, some environments, the results can can be kind of surprising, um, and to have students experience that um, outcome for themselves, I think is more powerful than than just saying what the result is. Um, and I think in that case, a great example is um, you know one of the classic uses is in an introductory to microeconomics course, having some sort of competitive market. Um, where there are buyers and sellers. And of course, you know, our standard approach is saying, ah, you know, there is this price that equates supply, you know, quantity demanded to quantity supplied, and that is the equilibrium. And trust us, this is what competitive markets find, right? I think it's a lot more powerful if in fact you endow people with, um, with demand, you endow people with the ability to supply, you let them at it. And if you're able to then show you know, absent any intervention, we actually found this outcome. I think that's a lot more powerful than just telling them that's what should happen. Great, thank you. So on that theme, um, and very much on the theme of CTEL and Warwick economics, we like a bit of show and tell. Um, so what we're going to do now is Umberto is going to show his platform, and then Bob's going to show you what he uses. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to run full experiments or games. Um, Bob, maybe while Umberto is showing his, you could put some links into the different platforms that you mentioned as well while they're going. So, Umberto, do you want to screen share and talk us through your econ class experiments? Sure. Um, so first, let me make a, a point. So it's 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 a, so the the classics platform I use is, is not my platform. Uh, it's the platform of uh, Marcus. But I wish it were mine. Uh, uh, but it's 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 true that these experiments we have collaborated on creating hmm, the ones I'm gonna I'm gonna show here. Uh, let's see. Share a screen. So and actually, what I want to show, I think you can see my screen now. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, I cannot see, it. see the chat now. So here you have. Hmm, so what I want to show is how easy it is to run an experiment with this platform, okay? So if I'm instructor, I go to my classroom and I tell my students I'm gonna run an experiment today and I haven't announced anything like today, the only thing I need to do is say to provide them with, with a link. Either the link you have here, I don't know if you can post this. I think uh, you can post, maybe you can post this in the YouTube channel or uh, in the chat here in Zoom, or I can show them the QR and they only have to scan the QR. As soon as you scan the QR or you go to this link, you are already a participant in this, uh, in this uh, no, you are, you are already entered 
the room and I see uh, there are still not many people, but let me, hmm, let's see if we have time to do this. Otherwise I can just play with some dummy players. Okay, so there are one more person, so it's a... Uh, okay, so everyone, Marty's just put yeah. the link into the chat so that you can okay. click on it. So maybe we, so while, hmm, while we wait, let me just wait for a couple of minutes to see if we get some people uh, who wants to join, because that will give you exactly the experience of what's, you know, what's the role of, of a student. Uh, so let me, um, while we wait for that, let me say a couple of things. First is that uh, one of the, I think one of the advantages, there are several platforms that help you run in experiments. Uh, why I went for ClassX was basically because it's free, right? So this is freeware. Uh, if it's free, it's been always free and it will always be free. Uh, Sorry, and, there, can I just interrupt yeah. a minute because it's asking sure. us for a password when we go into it. Is it it's asking for a password? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the password, uh, it should, uh, so the password should be, uh, it's, uh, it's only in lowercase. Uh, let me just put the password one, two, three, and then you see how easy I can change. So course data and I just can change. One, two, three, one, two, three. Great, thank you. Okay, so password is one, two, three, and now it should uh, back to overview. Now the link, huh, it will be, the QR should be the same, hmm? but now the link may not work. Okay, so as I was saying, so this is this is all freeware. Is it working now? Can you enter? I'm just trying to find you again. Okay. Let's start again. Anyone else in? Uh, I have. Oh, Enrica has a. There are seven. There are, there are seven people in. There are seven people in. It's probably just me. I'm that student. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So maybe now that I changed the power, password, maybe I made it more difficult for other people to join in. But okay. in any case, I can show you what happens. Yep. It's not, a, it's, it's not a, a big deal. So let me tell you. So you, you only have to, uh, it's, it's very much in line of all these projects that want to provide all this uh, free material for the internet. Uh, so this is the platform. This is ClassX. So when you enter, I, I, I'm not going to explain the platform because it's, again, it's not mine, but I just want to show you that there are many, many type of experiments. There are experiments on micro, macro, uh, experimental ethics, uh, environmental economics. Mm? So each one of these is a folder where you have mm, many, many different experiments. So the one I have, more, uh, I've been working on, it's this one folder on econ class experiments and the companion web page is the one I provided before, where you can find all the instructions for the, hmm? so you can find the, some, some of the experiments, all the instructions for the, uh, for, for the professor uh, and all the companion material. So their instruction manual, their student manual, there are Excel files that what they do is they give you the answer to the homework that is related to the experiment and it's uh, tailored to the results that you obtain in your experiments. There are warm up quizzes and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's say, hmm? so let's start with this, with this experiment. There are, huh? there are only seven people. There are not too many people signing, but huh? so the only thing you have to do to your students is to provide them, to provide them with a link and that you could do it in the classroom. You could do it online. Once they are in, I can show you, huh? this is, this could be the mobile device of the student. It could be, this is the view of the student or the view of the person who has logged in and huh? they are waiting for the game to start. And let me do a very easy game. Huh? That's it's actually, it's, it's a macro game and it's called a face beauty context. And here each participant has to choose two faces, hmm? the two prettiest faces. Hmm? among the ones I'm gonna show, okay? These are the eight faces. 
and you have to choose the two prettiest one. Uh, and the winner, and that's it, this is the key, the winner is the person who votes for the faces who receive the higher number of votes. You don't win if you, if you vote for the prettiest, you win if you vote. Uh, this is the Keynes example for the, for the stock market. Uh, so it's Keynes fist. Hmm? Uh, uh, beauty contest. And if you are a student, what you see in your, uh, so I, I change them. Uh, so if I go, I, I do a test the student. This is what the students see either in their phone, in their, in their tablet or in their laptop. And what they have to do is to vote for the two. Uh, so I'm gonna vote for these two. Uh, these are the two prettiest. I submit and I make the decision, okay? So here there are uh, very, few, very few people. And then when you finish, uh, I don't know, uh, there are five people who have responded. Mm, and of course we, uh, we won. Uh, we are the two prettiest faces in, in the group, okay? which uh, I don't know why I'm bigger than, than Bob. It should not be, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any message, uh, but, but it shows this is the type of example. So students get um, surprised. So that's, uh, we know that surprise, it's a very powerful tool for teaching. So they get surprised and then I don't tell them what to do. Uh, I don't tell them what this means. I ask them, uh, so what do they mean? And that's the, the beauty of the experiment. You can reflect why this happened, what did you think, and you can reflect on your own experience, okay? So this is a very simple, huh? a very simple game. There are games that are and, and more and closely, uh, closer to the, to the games I'm, uh, uh, are in the econ class experiments. So there are, huh? there are Apple market, there are taxis, there are the idea of, uh, so this is a game I like, uh, it's the fish market. And here, uh, let me add a few more participants. And this idea of adding participants, what helps you is you can play uh, as if you were in the classroom before going to the classroom. So you get used to the, to the experiment beforehand. And in this one, uh, we have, we have six participants, that's correct. Uh, so in this one, they are, uh, it's, it's, it's a trading bit type of experiments where they are buyers and they are sellers. But the thing is that they buy and they sell fees. So uh, I'm not gonna tell all the, all the details, but the idea is that you can trade with each other. Mm -hmm. So we start the game and I'm gonna show you what the students see. Mm -hmm. So in this, ses in this session, you are a demander, you have a buyer value, or you are a seller, mm -hmm and you got one fish. In this case, marginal cost is zero, so there is no cost of production, but there is a fixed cost of 10 euros. Huh? You can choose the currency, yeah? we can put pounds if you want, uh, of, of, of 10 euros huh? that you already pay for it. If we talk to each other and we agree, huh? so this, this uh, demander is willing to pay up to 25, hmm? it's a, uh, uh, and we agree, then I sell for 23, okay? So this one, actually it's a version online. So what I do is I make proposals huh? and all the players, all the, demand, all the demanders receive the, these proposals. Hmm? So there is, eh, there, we are very few people. It ended up that to be only one, huh? because we are seven people, right? be only one, one seller. So. I do this and if this one, this demander accept, it accepts, the transaction is made and for everybody and for the instructors, you can see the transaction online, okay? So uh, this is how it works, but what I want, uh, so these are previous experiments, so you can also go to previous uh, sessions and let's see this one uh, with 40 students, you can see all the transactions and you get uh, the transactions to get a charge of how the transactions happened and what we see in this case, what we did in the last, in this experiment, in the last session, what happens is you, you flood the market with fish. So there are too much fish uh, and the price, it goes and it converges to zero as, as, as it should be. And all the fish are, and, and all the, 
the fissures get, get uh, losses. Okay, so you get the data, you get predictions mm, that you can see beforehand of what's going to happen, and and that's the easy way to to run the experiment. So this is this is the the version online. The one we have run so far, it's been more the version in in person, mm, where the transactions happened. Mm, so if we restart the game. Now, what it shows is that it, it identify the demander and then, and that's what I like, and I think it's one of the powerful things. And we should not forget about the idea that it's good that the students interact. So students could be talking to each other. We agree, we negotiate the price, and then we, I talk to this buyer, and uh, uh, this one has a very low uh, very buyer value of five, and we agree that I'm going to sell the fees to you for three. I, I sell the fees for three, and I know that you are, you tell me that you are buyer six. Oh, okay. I sell the fees, and then the other buyer receives the offer and can accept or reject the offer. Okay? So this is just a couple of examples. Hmm? And, of course, it gets, the transactions get presented for everybody, and we can get all the collections of the, of the transactions. Uh, right. What I think it's important is that, that no, in this web page you can get all the instructions and also the idea of the tips on how to run these experiments and what you could get into, no, what kind of issues you can you you can encounter huh? and and so. But I, I stop here. Great, thanks, Humberto. If you can stop screen sharing, Let so Bob well. can. Stop oh. sharing. Yeah. So just two quick questions for you while Bob's getting ready. Um, Bob, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, there was one question about whether any of the games are available in other languages, including Spanish, in the experiments, Umberto? I think, Umberto, you're muted. Ah, I, I was giving. <laughs> the microphone to to both too early. Uh, so so the exper so these experiments they are both in Spanish and in English. Mm -hmm. So okay. they actually they were run in English and we adapted to. So they they were programmed in English and we adapted in in Spanish. The other experiments in in German. I think most of them they are in English. Uh, the possibility that this platform gives you is that you can use one of these experiments and you can change the language or adapt the experiments to yourself, or uh, if you are skilled enough even to program the, the experiment from scratch. Great, thank you. Okay, Bob, over to you and MobLab. Great, um, you know, so, you know, as I said, the platform that I'm currently using is called MobLab. Um, and here, I just wanna take a step back and think about the different ways in which we can which we can run these games, markets, and experiments, and how it might fit in in our classroom. And so, traditionally, you know, in the classroom, everyone was together in the same place. And so, you know, either you know, pencil and paper, or these sort of computerized experiments were generally what one would use and what I what I use. Um, and you know, many of us have transitioned to online teaching. Um, for some of us, many of us, online teaching is going to be synchronous. All students are coming together at a pointed hour, perhaps they're spread throughout the globe. Um, and in that case, you know, Class X, um, Charlie Host Recon Lab, Mob Lab, all offer the same sort of functionality about students basically, you know, online come together and participate in the same market or experiment. Um, a different online use case, however, is asynchronous instruction, um, where students are not required to be in the same place at the same time. Um, and, you know, that makes, you know, many of these games experiments a lot more difficult. Um, I've been working with MobLab this, you know, for the last couple of months about implementing a, a solution that, that will at least work for, for some sorts of games. It's the ability to run 
um, experiments asynchronously where the students participate in the economic environment, but they play um, robot participants and not human subjects, uh, not other not human subjects, not other students. Um, so what you see in front of you is the Mob Lab console. Um, and, you know, as all of these platforms do, they have um, a bunch of different games that you can choose between. Um, and on the left are the different playlists, and this is a, a you know, which are just collections of activities. Um, and we can see the top one is currently running, Econ Teaching. Um, and so from the student point of view, um, this is what a student who logs in on the web would see. Um, hopefully you see um, active sessions, um, econ teaching. Um, and in this case, the student sees that there is one online activity to be um, that the student can participate in, right? And so the idea here is, is what we would want to do is lead students through the conduct of an in-class experiment but do these same procedures asynchronously where students can, can do it at their own leisure, right? And so in this playlist, right, we're gonna begin the activity, right? And so the first um, part of the activity is to watch the instructions, right? Um, making sure students are understand the rules of the game, I think is a part of classroom experiments that's too often overlooked. Um, when students are confused, they do, not so smart things. Um, students sometimes do not so smart things when they're not confused, but when they are confused, um, they're definitely gonna do some not so smart things. And so Mob Lab has, for each of the games, has video instructions. Um, so you can require students to watch the video instruction. This and is going to be fun. Um, let's make sure the student understands the instructions. Uh, marginal cost was in there. This is a Bertrand experiment, which is an experiment that I think runs rather well when played against um, robotic players. In this case, the marginal cost is $2, which I remember because I watched the instructions. Um, in this implementation, we make it easy for students to, to um, figure out the general parameters of the game. This uh, the instructions told students that uh, in this market, a monopolist would charge $5. And because I remember that, I put in five, right? And I see, woohoo, um, I watched the instructions. I answered both of the questions correctly. Um, how you incentivize um, watching the instructions is up to you. Um, I'm now going to play the game. I don't want to see this pop up anymore. Um, and I get to choose a price. <laughs> I am going to choose $4. I submit. I find out what happens. All right, I was the low price player. Um, I'm gonna continue. And because I was so successful with $4, right? I'm gonna submit that again. Checking with others. Oh, and this being a Bertrand market, um, if the other competitor chose $3.37, I sell. And, and now the fun starts, right? If I, they chose 337 last time, I'm gonna choose 330. And the robotic player has chosen 229. Right, and so here's a case where the Mob Lab robotic player, you know, does a really good job of mimicking student play um, that they have witnessed, where students tend to charge prices near monopoly in the beginning, and then very quickly get into this price competition. Um, and you know, the Bertrand experiment is one that works really well live with students. Um, it works really well online. I think it works really well asynchronously. Um, and then similar to what Umberto was saying, another important part of running a human subject experiment is having students reflect upon what they did, right? And there's some actual evidence which shows right, that if you're just gonna run the experiment and students don't have an opportunity to reflect, you might just be wasting your time. There doesn't seem to be that much educational benefit, right? But the educational benefit of student participation in experiments seems to come from them actually reflecting on what happened and what they did. Right. So in this case, 
right? There is a reflection survey that comes up, right? The questions that I chose to ask are making sure students understand the idea of best responding, right? And then I ask them a more open-ended question to get them to reflect on what they did. And so, right, and so just in summary, this is just another way of running experiments, right? Um, you know, there's a variety, Mob Lab, Class X, Charlie Holt, Speak On Lab, um, a variety of ways that you can run experiments if your students are gonna come together um, at the same, you know, at the same time online. Um, you know, Mob Lab does, you know, it has started, you know, with this asynchronous delivery, which I think is, you know, something that could be interesting for those of us who um, are not going to have all of our students in the same place, at, or I'm sorry, virtually in the same place, but at the same time. Thank you. Right, thanks, Bob. Umberto, do you just want to jump in there on the sort of whether you think the way that you've been running the experiments could work either synchronously, virtually, or asynchronously at all? So I think, uh... So uh, my experience is it's with, with experiments in the, in the classroom, but I think many of these experiments, they can, uh, so some of them, I think uh, they can work asynchronously, but that uh, it's, it's not the, the ones I, I've been running, but that doesn't mean that you have to be with the students at the same time, because the only thing you have to do is to put a link and say this day from 12 to 12.30, you have to log in and, and run the experiment. So that's what it means synchronously. It doesn't mean that you have to be, uh, you don't need to see each other. Yeah, huh? that's a good point. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think, uh, so I think so, uh, the, this, so both, both platforms, I think they, are, they have a, a very good, uh, uh, it's a very good instrument, a very good tool. And, and running the experiment is what is important. And I, I agree, I've, I've had larger classes. Um, yeah. And when you have a larger class, you can get around the time zone issue, right? And so, you know, with a large class, you can say, I'm going to run, you know, three different sessions. They're going to be at, you know, you know um, institution time, 6 a.m., <laughs> noon, 6 p.m., yeah. right? And so that would be another way in which you could get around the, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the problems presented by the global pandemic and students across yes. the world. And can you then share the results with, like, do they see, you know, the kind of slides you, or things you were showing, Umberto, that you could see in terms of the charts and stuff, do the students see all that? Or can you share that with them afterwards? So we can, we can, we can, we, so we could uh, share the results afterwards of their own, hmm, of, of the experiment. And they could reflect on that, and you could build the, the classroom based on on this. Okay. But but one possibility is to just to break it in groups and then have them the meetings in small groups. So one of the advantages I think of, of being online is that so I my class my classroom usually have two hundred students. So one of the advantages of being online is that uh, maybe I'm able to break these big classrooms in smaller groups. Yeah, which uh, will help the the conversation. So we had a question from um, the chat around incentivizing students, um, mm -hmm. and it was sort of gauged in terms of how do you get them to act as if they're in an experimental lab. And I guess the first question is, do you expect them to act as if they're in an experimental lab, or do you accept that they might not act that way? Um, and if you do, how do you sort of incentivize them or organize them? And um, I'll ask Umberto first, but Bob, if you want to add anything afterwards, you can. So what, what we do, and my, so what we do is we give a very small percentage of the grade that it's connected to the performance in the experiments. But it's, it's connected in a way, and you can get uh, all the details, it's connected in a way that it's fair. Uh, so the issue of fairness is, is, is important. But my experience is that many times, uh, just social recognition of reputation, it's a big incentive for the students to, to try to do well. Huh? Okay. You are gonna get always people who, no, who are not interested, but these type of mistakes, you find them in, in real life in economics as well. 
And Bob, anything on yeah. that? Yeah, so I used to um, tie a small portion of marks to to um, how well they do in the game. Um, and quite, I mean, the decision that I made, and I think this is great because different people are gonna solve this in different ways. Um, the decision I made was, it was just too much of a hassle. Um, so in some cases, I will choose one or two participants and pay them real cash. Um, there's really nothing better than standing up in front of a room of students and giving students cash. It makes you kind of popular, um, harder in a virtual environment. Um, but for the most part, what I do is I say um, sincere participation gives you full, will get you full credit for participation. So students are required to participate, but they're basically zero one. Um, and I've had very, very, very little problem with students trolling the game, doing things stupid. Um, and I think, you know, first off for an experimental economics, it's already been shown that data tend to be a little bit noisier but you still get good data when you just ask human subjects to do their best, right? And I think particularly this generation, which for fun, right, gets on a computer and like engages in activities whose sole purpose is to accumulate points. Right? <laughs> Doing this is really kind of comes naturally for them. Um, so I've had no problem since I've transitioned to, you know, just try and collect as many points as you can. And, and students seem to think That's that cool. collecting points is a worthwhile activity, so I use it. And so thinking if, about if the... I may, If I may, yeah. just one second. So sometimes it's, it's so the, the hardest part is to motivate them to read the instructions carefully. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's, uh, you see, I think I, I see that Pop uh, agrees. And that's why there is these questions. And that's, I think it's important. That's something I learned with time, that having a little, Tests or quizzes, uh, four, qu or four questions or two question quiz before the, the experiment to motivate reading carefully the instructions, it's more important than really the incentives for the for the part for, for their performance. And um, Bob, if you looked at um any of the platforms that you've looked at, if you're thinking about using them virtually, is there any issue if say somebody drops out because their Wi-Fi is not working or they just choose to leave? So if you're midway through an game or an experiment and somebody leaves is that a problem or does it if it matter um i you know all of the platforms that i've used you know um have sort of baked in the imperfect world um okay, and good. all of the platforms that i've used and i'm sure it's the case with classics as well um you know if a student drops out they're able to re-enter um, so that hasn't been been an issue Okay, and what if they just choose to go back to bed? So you're one person. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <not> teenagers. <laughs> I mean, I, and I think this is this is where you know there you know and I think across the board there there are potential for issues. Um, you know, especially when you have a four player game and you know player number four you know opts and stops playing. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's going to vary on the platform, et cetera. I mean, on occasion, you know, I know in some circumstances it will stop group number 13 from continuing. In other cases, you know, a decision will be made on that student's behalf. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, that that is a potential issue that, you know, different platforms I know are solving differently. Um, so, Umberto, if we go back to thinking about the lecturer, and obviously lots of people are looking at this as a way to engage students and create student communities when they're virtual, how easy do you think this is for a lecturer to pick up now and sort of have ready for the full term to get going with? I think it's, 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 it's very easy. So uh, starting running uh, an experiment is extremely easy. Uh, with all the you know, all the platforms and all the material that there exists right now, uh, the most difficult part is to overcome the fear of running an experiment. Yeah. Uh, so my recommendation is my 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 sorry <laughs> my recommendation my my recommendation is uh, uh, 
So start with an experiment. You can use uh, any of these platforms to make mock experiments. You can create your dummy students, uh, run them, and talk to people who have done an experiment. And, and let me just say one thing. I've not, uh, as a researcher, I don't do experiments. Well, now I may be in borderline. But I've been using experiments for teaching for over 10 years. We haven't, we, and I've never, and until recently, I've never done an experiment for research. So you don't need to be an experimentalist in order to do, yeah. to use uh, experiments for, for teaching. And, and if you talk to people who run experiments, what they tend to say is students get engaged, they get excited, and I, as, as, as instructor, I get excited as well because I discover things and I learn a lot of things while, while doing experiments. And um, Bob, what about, I'm sure there are challenges. I obviously for Umberto was that student who couldn't get in. Um, how would you sort of advise people to prepare for the challenges and find ways around them? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think, I think one of the great things is, you know, we're all being thrown outside of our comfort zone. So we're getting a little bit used to um, failures. And, you know, uh, you know I, I had to laugh when Alberto had a person walking behind them. And it's like, yes, welcome to teaching in, in you know, 2020. Um, I mean, one, one issue that, that often comes up is, you know, and this, I think, talks to what Alberto, you know, brought up about one of the big fears is, you know, what happens when I don't get what I expect? Um, and, you know, I think at least part of it is, is you know, is, you know, embrace the uncertainty. Um, you, yeah, you, you're losing control. Um, and I think it helps to sort of think about like, what are the common, you know, wh what are common outcomes that you could, you could get um, and then, you know, be prepared to bring it back to the student to ask them what they did, right? And I think, well, sometimes, you know, you, in essence, you can't lose. And so if you're playing a prisoner's dilemma, right, you're going to have some uh, groups that are going to, you know, going to play the Nash equilibrium, and you're going to get some groups that are able to sustain cooperation. Right. And bringing it back to students and, you know, asking them, you know, those that were not able to cooperate, what happened, those that were able, right, I think enables lively you know, discussion and also gets us to, you know, then sort of go from, you know, defection and lack of cooperation to environments where we see more cooperation. Um, and so I think, you know, being a little bit prepared that results might not be exactly what um, you expect. Is, is helpful, but also using this as an opportunity to say, okay, why did you do what you did, right? And does this help us understand, um, you know, understand theory, right? Having a student say in a prisoner's dilemma game that I actually get happiness from being a good person enables us to go back and say, that's not in the assumption, right? And if we assume, you know, I what we assume in economics. Great, thank you. So I'm conscious of time. Can I just, before I ask a question to Umberto on my own behalf, um, check if there's any other questions from the room at this point? You go, Claudia. Thanks, Steffi. Um, so Umberto, I have the joy of um, taking over teaching part of the first year economics course in UCL next year um, and shall be teaching the game theory and strategic interaction bit. And I was just wondering, if for somebody like me, so I can see that, you know, I can give the students the textbook to read, I could potentially set up some kind of game offline for them to work on, like you say, at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? Well, but let me put the question another way. If I was in the classroom with them for two hours, how long would you suggest I allow for running an experiment out of a two hour session? And then if I was to have an hour or maybe 40 minutes synchronously in a Zoom session with them, what's yeah. the best use of that time? 
So, so the experiments, so I, I think an experiment, it, it depends, uh, depends on the type of experiment, but it could be good that experiments take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to run the experiment. So there should be some time beforehand in order to make sure that uh, students know well uh, the instructions and their, uh, and if they do mistakes is because they want to do them, not because they didn't know what to do. And, and it's important to leave time for the discussion. It's important yeah. to see the results. It's important for the, to ask the students, well, this is what happens. Sometimes what happens is, is what you were expecting. Sometimes, as Bob said, it's not what you were expecting. And you can ask them both what, you, what did you do, and that's important, but sometimes it's most important, why do you think this other person acted in this way? Okay, this putting yourself in the shoes of another player, it's really great in trying to awaken the economic intuition of students. And for what my, I, for talk, from talking to, to students, what I found out is that they said that they were able to learn many concepts that usually for us, we take for granted and we think are very easy. Hmm? Yeah. Like concept as simple as equilibrium. Uh, or, or more complicated at a stable and stable equilibria. Just from seeing what happens, seeing how they behave or trying to reflect how they behave and in particular, how other people behave. Yeah. And if uh, I can just jump in really quickly, um, I just want to second exactly what Ambrose said. Don't try and get this over as quickly as possible. Um, I think in with any sort of active learning that you're going to bring into your classroom, you're going to slow things down. And quite honestly, that's probably not a bad thing because I think most of us, um, you know, can think that we can lecture really quickly and we can lecture really quickly. Um, but that doesn't mean well, we should. Really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, I do think that this, you know, if any time we're going to bring active stuff into the classroom, it's going to slow us down. And, and I don't know that that's a bad thing. So do you then take stuff out of the class and expect students to do it themselves somewhere else anyway, even before being virtual? Um, if I mean, I like to think that I've pared down my syllabus. <laughs> my students, my students might disagree. Um, yeah, you know, and one other, you know, one other last word of wisdom or thing that often comes up is, do you do the experiment first or do you do the experiment second? Yeah. Um, and my general rule is, if knowing the theory is going to affect how students play, I want to do the classroom experiment first. Um, if knowing the theory isn't going to affect, then I don't think it matters. And so, doing the supply and demand, whether you do it before or after. I don't think it really matters. But if you're going to do a prisoner's dilemma, definitely do the prisoner's dilemma before the before the theory, because the theory will, for better or for worse, okay. give students a prediction or a, a you know a sense of what they ought to play, which I don't think we want to do. Yeah. And um, Umberto, any last words of wisdom in that sort of vein? Well, I don't know if, if words of wisdom, but let me just uh, say a couple of things to uh, to conclude, so one, it's uh, it's it's important to to engage students. It's important to motivate students. It's important that the students find out the results rather than we give the results to them. And experiment is a, is a magnificent tool for this. Uh, and in that sense, and I think this is the only point where maybe both and I don't. I completely 100% agree. I'm a big defender of doing the experiments beforehand because it forces students to think about an outcome, a result, where you haven't told them anything about it. Okay, and that having to struggle to find something out, I think it's very helpful to, to enhance the, the, the understanding of, of topics. And just let me say that one, one last one, one line. So one project I'm, I'm now, huh, for those people who are thinking about using the core econ project. So one of the projects we have in mind is we are 
uh, in the way of trying to write a, a book of experiments for that it's tailored to to the core econ project uh, and using uh, classics or, or other platforms but that should be uh, hopefully uh, in the near future not by october the 6th by any chance but <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, any more questions for the floor before we close up? Or from YouTube, Parama, anything? I think we're good. I think we asked uh, most things. Um, so yeah, we're having a bit of a discussion about the run there, but no, apart from that, we're good. Great, um, and thank you to the people who sent in questions in advance. I think we've through the discussion answered most of them. If not, apologies. Um, but I hopefully you've all got a good sense of the value of these active learning sessions. Um, I certainly, as somebody who teaches competition economics, will be looking very closely at these. Um, but as Bob hinted at earlier, I'm definitely one of those people and Umberto who's kind of afraid of them. Um, so I think seeing them in action and seeing that there are platforms there that provide you with lots of instructions is very useful. So let me just conclude by thanking our two speakers. So thank you to Umberto for joining us from Barcelona. Are you in Barcelona today? Yes, I am. Yeah. And to Bob from joining us from all the way on the west coast of the US. So getting up early for us. Um, our next seminar is in two weeks um, and that will be the last one before the summer break. So I hope many of you can join us then. I think Maddie's gonna start advertising it tomorrow or the day after for registration. Um, there is a quick question, Bob. Can we accept your games in Mob Lab? I'm, I'm not sure what that means, accept your oh, games. Oh, access, sorry, typo. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, so you know, Mob Lab has a complete um, roster of games um, and they do have an ability. So, you know, uh, once you sign up for an instructor account, I can share my, courses with anyone and so you know if if I have a particular way of doing things then yes I can I can definitely share them with you just need to sign up for an instructor account with MobLab. And you said MobLab is paid for is that right? MobLab is is paid for um, their traditional model is that students pay I get it bundled with the textbook um, I know there are certain departments which have signed up for for a license yeah so okay. yeah Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a very nice rest of your Wednesday, however long that Thank might you. be. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot.